and welcome back to the Chronicles of Aguna, the Arsenal podcast brought to you by AMS Media. As ever, I'm your host, Harry Simeon, and this is episode two of our Arsenal Gold series. We're going to be talking to some former players. We're going to be reliving some of the greatest games uh, in Arsenal's history as well. So lots to come over the coming weeks. We know that times are very difficult. We know that people are bored. Um, it is for the greater good that we're staying home, and we know that it's really, really important. But um, just wanted to let you know that we're going to keep putting out as much good quality content as we possibly can over the next few weeks to ensure that you are getting your football and Arsenal, I guess, fix um, over the next few weeks. So um, this was my chat with Kevin Campbell, uh, which took place on Friday. Um, so if there's any inaccuracies or if anything's changed since then uh, from the discussion we had, you know why. Uh, this was recorded on Friday. It was great fun, a great chat. And my thanks to Kevin Campbell once again. Hope you enjoy it. Welcome back to the Chronicles of Aguna, Mr. Kevin Campbell, Super Kevin Campbell. How you doing, mate? Hi, Harry. How are you, mate? You, you and your family okay? All good. All good. We're a little bit bored, but, you know, it's for the greater good. And this is a really, really strange situation. And I don't think it's too much to ask of people to just simply stay home. So, you know, we're following the guidelines, making sure uh, that everybody's safe and stuff. And, and, and it is what it is, isn't it, Kevin? How about you? How are you getting on? Yeah, I'm fine. I've, I've not, not bored at all or anything. I'm, I make myself, I've got quite a few things to do anyway. So, um, I'm enjoying it. It's, it's it's really interesting to to be in this sort of position. So uh, I relish it, to be honest. It I don't, don't want it to happen forever, Harry. But <laughs> you know, I'm going to enjoy it while it's here. Absolutely, and it does give you time, doesn't it, to do things that maybe you don't always get time to do in your day-to-day -day life. You get to spend more time with your family. You get to catch up with with things when life gets a little bit too much. Sometimes you can fall behind. So. I know the reasons that we, we're being sort of asked to do this are, are not ideal and, and it's horrible to hear of people losing their lives, but it, you can use it to your advantage as well, I suppose. I think it's really important. We have to, Harry, to be honest, because, you know, there ain't many times where, you know, you can actually let the wind out your sails and, and, and decompress a little bit, you know, uh, with your family or whatever. So... It's interesting to hear how many people are actually relishing it, how many people are bored. We know what's happening with the economy-wise and, and jobs and stuff like that. But, you know, the humanity side of it, I think um, we're going to learn a lot. And it makes you realise just how much we miss, we miss football as well. You know, it makes you, makes you really uh, take these things into consideration and relish them. Absolutely, absolutely. Kevin, the, the reason I've asked you on um, is to talk to you about some of your favourite memories in an Arsenal shirt. And it's part of our Arsenal Gold series that we're running during this break from football. Um, and we're going to be talking to a number of some of your ex-teammates as well over the course of the next couple of weeks. So Harry, you... how long have you got? Jeez, <laughs> asking me. <laughs> I mean, this is, for me, this is like perfect. You know, I know we haven't got long, but um, listen, memories, I've got memories upon memories upon memories, you know, as a fan and as a player. Kevin, we've got uh, as long as you need, my friend, as long as you need. Don't worry about that. <laughs> well, look, well the, 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 you know, the, fir the first one is actually not a game. The first thing I relish uh, going to Highbury for the first time wasn't actually the game. It was the... And a lot of people remember it. It was the the scene. The scene was set. You come out of Arsenal Tube Station and, you, and you, you're going along the road. You, the North Bank was right there. But it was hustling, but the programme sellers were out. And um, my friend had a pitch right on the corner, Mitch and, and, and his dad. I sold all the programmes at the corner. And then when you turn the corner... Then you obviously you, you, you're looking up at the the east stand, etc. So it was going up the hill, and you had the the steps going up to the marble halls, the entrance to the ground, and stuff like that. But that was it was just a buzz and a sea of people, and you know anybody who remembers that that scene, we miss it because the smell of hot dogs and even the horses <laughs> and stuff like that. It was all there, wasn't it? It was all there. Absolutely. So that was my first, that was my first love about Arsenal. It was just that, that feeling. Absolutely. And for me, you know, as a, a young lad sort of going down there with my dad to watch games and stuff, what I used to love about it is that 
you used to be able to catch glimpses of of Highbury through the houses as you were walking yes. along the main road. I couldn't wait to get to the next turning to have another glance at the stadium. And as, yeah. as as beautiful and as wonderful as the Emirates Stadium is as an arena and the fact that, you know, it's all sort of built on a kind of platform and you can literally walk around the whole outside of the ground. It, it's not the same. It doesn't give you that same uh, buzz. You don't get the little glimpses that you used to get at Highbury, which for me, it is one of the most incredible things and one of the things that I miss most, for sure. Yeah, it is iconic. And look, it's, it's the authenticity of, of Highbury, isn't it? I think the authentic feel um, of Highbury is second to none. A lot of a lot of us guys who are older, who have obviously went to the games at Highbury, and then obviously now, you know, whether we comment or we go to the games at uh, at the Emirates, we we know both sides now. We much prefer the authentic side because it's the real side. It's what we grew up with, and you know, going. That's why. Going to the night games under the lights at Highbury was always special because it kind of lit up like a spaceship. You know, when when you were going down the road, you, you could see the floodlights, you could see the 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 the, the glow from Highbury, and that's why again at night it was it really was special. But Harry, we haven't got enough time for me, mate. <laughs> so let's get cracking. <laughs> When, Kevin, when was the first time you experienced Highbury? Had you been before you were playing for the club? Is it something that you experienced as sort of growing up as a young man? Or Growing up as a kid, I went to my first game in 1977. Um, 1977, it was Arsenal versus Middlesbrough. And it was... I couldn't even... Me, me friends at the time couldn't even afford to get in. So we was wait, kind of just waiting around outside, listening to the oohs and ahs of the crowd. <laughs> but it was, um, Middlesbrough took the lead in the first half and uh, uh, Frank Stapleton equalised, one each. And we kind of got to see the last 50, 50, 20, 15, 20 minutes of the game. But it was such a significant day because Spurs got relegated that day. Wow. I hope I live so to could, see that. I hope I get right, to see so, that. So you could imagine, that's my first, I supported Arsenal in my life, but that was my first time I've actually been to the stadium. And to hear all the people with the radios, you know, they, they could be going down and all that. Do you know what I mean? So that created another buzz within itself. And I, I mean, I was hooked before, but that made it even better, didn't it? You know, that just hooked me straight away. So that that was my first moment of of being at Highbury and and um, watching the team and stuff like that. And I was hooked. I was sold from there. Brilliant stuff. You know, and then obviously I, you're, you're, I'm playing football myself as a kid and stuff. And you know, we're pu- we're pooling money to go up and buy one program. Do you know what I mean? It was one of them. We we, we couldn't afford it. So any chance after that, I got Harry. I I, I took it with both hands and. Um, Used to go up to Highbury as, as much as I can, but you know, was trying to wanted to be a footballer so much that you know that took a lot of my Saturdays after um, a few years. So I couldn't get to Highbury as much as I would like. Yeah, I can imagine. I mean, when you were playing football as a kid, sort of in the playgrounds, you know, I used to play football in the street. I'm sure you probably played yeah. in the street as well with your mates. What what who did you used to imitate? Because I I used to run around my garden pretending I was Robert Perez. I even used to put a <laughs> hairband on my head when I didn't have long enough hair. I used to imitate yeah. the way he ran everything. It, Robert Perez was my idol at the time. Um, who did you used to imitate? Who did you used to look at and think I, I want to be well, this guy? Well, it was weird because my favourite player was Liam Brady, and. I, I, I was I, I was predominantly right footed. I could kick with my left, but I was predominantly right footed. So, you know, I really wanted to be able to be a left footer like Brady was, but I couldn't. So, at the time, I, I liked Frank Stapleton as well. So, you know, Frank Stapleton was a striker, scored goals, could head it, and all that kind of thing. So, you know, I used to fluctuate between the two. Anytime I used to be a midfielder, I was like, you know, a right footed Brady type of thing. <laughs> And uh, whenever I I got up top or I scored goals, it was Stapleton. They were my two guys at the time. Brilliant stuff. 
In terms of some of your other memories, some of your favourite memories, and I know there are so many and it's so difficult to condense this down, so I'm going to leave it to you to do that with that impossible task of narrowing it down to the, the ones that mean the most to you. And, you know, I know when we look back at, at the careers of some players, there are certain games that, of course, are historic in the you know in the club's history um, and really significant to the club and to the fans. But I'm interested in delving into your uh, memories personally, as in what did they? I'm more basically what I'm trying to say is I'm more interested in the why they meant so much to you rather than yeah, the actual I, moments. I think you know. I think there's there's only really, and this is the truth, and it's crazy that it may seem that way. Obviously, if we had if we had an hour, I could I could um, flip through my roller decks and, and, <laughs> and check everything out, right? But I'm going to be honest with you, Harry. A lot of the games that really mean a lot to me. I wasn't involved in um, a lot. For instance, you know, 89, 89 at Anfield to, to just be a young player and travel with the team and see what goes into it. And remember, we were, we were on the, we were on the move now. Arsenal under George Graham was on the move. Beat Liverpool in the in the um, League Cup, etc. A year before, and or a couple of years before, and stuff. And it was you know Arsenal going to challenge Arsenal. George Graham's building something, and then to culminate into the top two playoff at Anfield. And, and the weird thing that happened at Anfield as well, which is what made it even more special for the likes of myself, was the lads who weren't playing or on the bench. We had, we had to go and sit in with the Arsenal fans behind the goal. Oh, brilliant. So we were experiencing, I mean, I'm a fan, so I was experiencing all the emotions of, of the fans and I, I recognised quite a few of the lads who were there, do you know what I mean? Some some real good 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 boys who were there. Saw my mate Mitch who, who had the pitch on the corner and, and it was we felt like fans. We were players, but we actually felt like fans, you know. And and to know, to be in the dressing room before the game and, and, and hear what the team talk was and then to go and sit with the fans. And obviously fans are like, you know, lads, are we going to do it? Can we do it? Like, don't worry, Neil. George Graham wants it. If it's nil, nil, you know, we've got them where we want them. And they're looking at us like, what the hell are you talking about? Do you know what I mean? It was it was crazy. And, and the way it happened, with five minutes ago, we all... Um, go through the gate and leave the Arsenal fans and then we get to the side of the pitch and then Michael Thomas goes through and scores and I get accosted by the I was about to run on the pitch the, the policeman grabbed me and stuff like that because I lost it um, and just that whole feeling and the whole journey back and everything that, that day was so significant for that squad but it also put some some more hunger into the likes of myself, Alan Miller, um, David Hillier, Stephen Morrow and all these guys because we were right on the cusp of breaking through into the first team. Yeah. I'd made my debut, obviously, in 88, which which was a fantastic day for me. But I think what we're talking about here is significant days. And that was a, a significant day in, in, um, in Arsenal for me. As a player Absolutely. or a fan, it was unbelievable. What was the uh, what was the after party like, Kevin? I know uh, th that particular time there was a bit of a reputation amongst some of the group for you know going out and enjoying themselves. I can imagine the celebrations were were unreal that night. Well, do you know, it was it was um, it was really interesting because when we all got into the dressing room, we were buzzing because we'd been in with the fans. You know, the emotions were flop rolling high. Got into the dressing room. And like, the lads are just sitting about, having a beer, having a glass of champagne. I remember I had a tin of uh, a beer in my hand and I clinked it. I sat down by Rocky, um, which is obviously significant for this week. So I sat down beside Rocky and it, I just said, Rocky, how does it feel, man? He just says, it feels special. It really, really just, but it was it, there was a humbleness to it. You know what I mean? All the lads, there was no flash stuff going in, and um, the door got knocked, and it was uh, the Liverpool staff had come running around, and Roy Evans and all these guys, the back, the boot room guys, came in and brought their champagne in and said, "Listen, guys, you the guys 
deserve it. You came here, and I thought that was a touch of class. You know, they, they were champ, they were champions, and then we come and pimp them at their own ground. It's, it's easy for them to throw the toys out the pram, but they didn't. They were they were gracious, and you know everybody was just amazing, man. It was unbelievable. Get on the coach, and you're on the way back, and. We go along the East Lanks Road and the Everton fans are doing the conga. There was a big <laughs> pub on the, you know, it, it was just Liverpool fans are crying, Everton fans are doing the conga, and then you you, you hit the motorways, and then we get to I think we got to Cockfosters, yep. and the police come, uh, the police come into the uh, sh- uh, stop the coach. So everyone, George Graham, everyone's on there. You know what's going on? They said, "Well, we got to stop the coach because the the roads are, are crazy going down to Southgate." You know, so we were like, "Buddy, you can imagine the boys are buzzing." Then I can picture so the were, actual scene because that's kind of my area. I can picture that's your, that's the your exact area, yeah. scene. Incredible. So we went to we we went down and we got to went to the winners' club. I don't know if you remember. You're probably too young then. Um, we went to the winners' club in Southgate. They were all gooners everywhere, and we got off the. We got off the. I think I'm sure there's some video footage of the lads getting off the, getting off the coach, looking a bit, you know, a, a bit all over the place because the ties were undone and the shirts were open and stuff like that. You know, the boys have been buzzing, but we went in the winners' club and had a, a, a great night in the winners' club. But there was only myself and Rocky, who were going back to the ground. With, with Tony Donnelly and, and the coach driver. So we left the winners' club, crazy o'clock, I think it was about five or five, something like that, jumped on the coach. All, everybody else had their cars at London Coney. So we go back to the ground. So there he is. Just imagine this, Harry. Dave Rowcastle's just played in the biggest game of his life, <laughs> just picked Liverpool to the title, been out all night, and we get back to the ground me and Rocky are putting the skips inside of Highbury. Wow. With all the kit. And there's a, there's a lad on the steps who was asleep, fast asleep. So Rocky said, Rambo, do you reckon we should wake him up? So I said, yeah, let's wake him up. So we woke him up. Rocky got three cans of beer and Rocky sat down with him and asked him, you know, what was his night like? That would never happen now. You know, Rocky showed him his, his winner's medal, et cetera, et cetera, and the guy took him into the marble halls, and the guy was just blown away. He, he just couldn't believe it. He, the, the love he had in his eyes for Rocky was ridiculous. I mean, everybody loved Rocky. He was that type of guy. But, you know, that day was so significant for me, and we got a taxi back to Brixton, and Rocky got the taxi driver playing all the old Bob Marley songs and we were like singing all the way. You know, things like that mean so much, Harry. Yeah. Uh, so much, not just the game, but it's everything they're, to do with memory. that it's game. It's just memories, it isn't it? So much. Yeah, it means so much. I remember that journey back f- f- and we drove through Islington and stuff and all the gooners were out and right, Rocky, everybody was trying to ru- rush the car and stuff. You know, it was a special time, man was a special time and then obviously a couple of days later it was the uh or should I say the next day it was the um the parade yeah at, at, at the town also now it was an amazing day so that was one significant day that believe me I could do a whole show on it I can imagine I can imagine and I'm glad you mentioned Rocky there because as you said this is a significant week um at the yeah. time of recording you know 19 years have passed and I don't remember Rocky playing for Arsenal. I've seen lots of clips and and from that you can gauge what a top, top quality footballer he was. But it's great to hear some of the other stories, some of the stories about his humility and his humbleness. Because like you said, a lot of the things um, where, you know, sitting and talking with fans and stuff, that doesn't go on as much anymore. I think that there are probably a number of reasons for that. I think that People are more wary of fans and the press given the way things are now with social media and stuff like that, which is understandable. But it just shows that, you know, particularly in them days, how close the players and the fans were. And when I hear stories like that, it makes me a bit jealous that I wasn't around in that particular period because yeah, I think we as sort of the more, I'm not going to say, well, the younger fans, I think we've kind of missed out on that a little bit. Yeah, Harry, I think you're right. I think anybody who was around in that era and 
you, well, if you remember rightly, the Arsenal Supporters Club used to just be opposite, yeah, um, right. just at the end of the road, didn't it? You know, um, just around that corner. And players used to be seen in there regular. Players used to go in and mingle with the fans, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Whether you've had a good game, bad game, indifferent game. The Arsenal players used to go in there and mingle and, you know, listen, we know that social media back then used to be the fans the fanzine. Yeah. And the radio, wasn't it? That was the social media. But the, the, the sinister part of, of playing for Arsenal wasn't, you know, you could get stick. Of course you could get stick. But it was a. It, you didn't need the fans to tell you you'd play bad, if you know what I mean. Yeah. The, the, you knew if you'd played bad. But that feeling, because a lot of the boys had come through the ranks, and because a lot of the boys had come through the ranks, we all had red blood. In a sense, we were gooners. We were gooners, but we were gooners before. We were gooners coming up through the ranks, and then. M- m- being in the first team made it even more so why our feet were firmly on the ground because a lot of the fans followed us, you know, through the club. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, anybody like your age who maybe just missed out on that that feeling, you you missed some special times because Rocky, Tony Adams, all them Merce, all them guys at that time were so accessible do you know what I mean? They were, yeah. David O'Leary as well was a legend. Those guys were so accessible and were were happy to speak to to anybody. It was it was brilliant, brilliant upbringing for me. Paul Davis can't leave Paul Davis, Mickey Thomas out, Gus Caesar, Martin Hayes, and all the Quinny can't leave them guys out either. Brilliant, yeah, and and you're absolutely right. I think we did miss out on that particular period. And I see it sometimes when I'm at the Emirates stadium and I'm in the press box and, you know, they, they have the mix zone nowadays where, you know, players sort of pass through on their way out and sometimes they stop and chat to the press and sometimes they don't, but I guess more often than not, they just, a lot of them just get their head down and walk past. And I understand why they do that because it's not that they, they don't care. It's, that it's from probably from fear of saying something that's going to get overblown and made into a different story and drive criticism and and these things and it's it's a bit of a shame in the direction in which some of this stuff has gone but great memories and and always a pleasure hearing about it um kevin tell me about another special another, arsenal memory another special arsenal memory was fa cup final arsenal three manchester united two um alan sunderland scores the winner Arsenal are two and a lot cruising. I was a, I was a kid. That's when you could. That's when you used to plot and watch the watch the FA Cup all day. It was a day you know, event, wasn't it? Exactly. It was a day event and everything. And it was it was Arsenal Manchester United. It was it was huge, and you know the build up was special. I had friends who supported Man United in London, in Brixton. And we were totally against each other. I had other pals who supported Liverpool at the time, Gary and stuff like that. But, you know, I was Arsenal through and through and me and my brothers and stuff, we sit up all day long, all, all morning. And then the game come and Arsenal are 2-0, two 2-0 two up, absolutely cruising, looking like, you know, they're just going to win it outright. No problem. And then obviously Gordon McQueen pulls one back and then Sammy Rackeroy goes on that run. And you think, what has just happened? You know, it's ridiculous. And then Brady goes off on that run. This this goal was, we used to try and do it out in the, in the streets. You know, Brady went on that run and put it out to Rixie and Rixie put that ball in Sunderland at the back post. I ran out the house. <laughs> Harry, this is no word of a lie. When that went in, I jumped over the sofa and I ran out the house into the street and I was in the street just running about, yeah, screaming. And other, some of my other mates had run out of their house and well, we were in the street just cheering and stuff. And But the game hadn't finished. So I had to run back in. I thought it was over, but it wasn't. So I had to run back in. That 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 was an emotional roller coaster. And you know what, Harry? Arsenal never do things easy, do they? Never. <laughs> never. <laughs> they never do things easy. And that was one of the culminations of, you know, Arsenal never do it easy. Never do. 
So Arsenal were kind of a cup team at, by that time. So, you know, they got to a couple of cup finals and stuff. But that, that cup final in particular uh, really brings it home. And I remember, obviously, going to the football club and Pat Rice be, being my, my trainer as a, as a schoolboy and asking him, you know, what was it like? And he said, we, at one stage, they thought they'd messed it up because Man United were looking the stronger. But when you play for Arsenal, you have that resolve. And, you know, it's uh, we've seen it happen time and time again, Harry, haven't we? You know, that resolve, we don't know where the powers of recovery come from. But, but that, Arsenal, that Arsenal, to play for Arsenal, you need it. You need it. And my God, they've put us through some stresses over the years. I've got to say, uh, it's not always been easy being an Arsenal fan, but those moments are, are fully worth it. Um, Kevin, I wanted to get your opinion on a couple of current things as well. Um, yeah. And and one of those is, um, of course, Mikel Arteta, who took over the job in December. It's been a, a difficult season for Arsenal overall. I wasn't a fan of Unai Emery. Um, I, I never made any secret of that. And not because I didn't, like him or I didn't want him to do well personally it was just I never really got what it was he was trying to do um, I think that things unraveled pretty quickly towards the end and, and now Mikel Arteta has come in and I've been quite impressed with the way he's I wouldn't say he's turned our fortunes completely around but I would say he has steadied the ship and I think our improved defensive record tells you that what have you made of Mikel Arteta's I guess the beginning to his tenure yeah, um, I've been I've been impressed with the way Mikel Arteta's gone about his business. That's for sure. We know that um, results have improved slightly, whereas we, when we're losing games, we're probably we're probably drawn too many, and that's probably hindered him doing really well. Because if you could turn some of them draws into wins, you know we'd have been moving up the table, but. We have to look at where we were and, you know, we, defensively, we were awful. Under Unai Emery, we were awful at times. And the opposition just kept going through us, through our midfield as if it wasn't there. And, you know, we were, we were, we were all over the place at times. So, but just like any manager, um, whether it's, it's experienced or not, you've got to sort your defence out first. You have to, or else you leave yourself wide open. And we're seeing some some really we were seeing some really improved performances defensively. I think we suffered a little bit going forward at times, Agreed, which yeah. can happen. But I think defensively we saw we saw David Luiz play well as best <laughs> as his best can. football for <laughs> Arsenal. No, his best football for Arsenal under Mikel Arteta. We saw the midfield functioning a lot better in some of those games as well and the, probably one of the better performances was the Chelsea game which we lost yeah, um, but we ran, we ran out of a little bit of steam because the intensity that Mikel Arteta wants to play with it weren't in the players at the time so we, we suffered in that game went on to the Man United game and beat Man United convincingly and that was a lot more aggressive and, and we were on the front foot etc but the, the, the difference is we're not used to training and playing that, that intensity week in, week out. And it, it, it was always going to come and affect us at some stage. And unfortunately, it really affected us against Olympiacos. Yeah, agreed. You know, so go, go on, Harry, no, sorry. Go ahead. I was just going to say, I, I think people were kind of surprised by Mikel Arteta's approach because I think people maybe wrongly assumed that because he'd been working at Manchester City, because he'd been working under Pep Guardiola, who's, of course, his philosophy is so heavily built upon attacking play that Mikel Arteta was going to come here and just take the chains off and say, go out there and, and try and blow people away. But he's been a lot more pragmatic than I think I expected. And I think he surprised people in that sense. Well, I think the first thing after his first press conference everybody thinks Pep Guardiola his system is attack 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 <laughs> Pep Guardiola's system is work hard graft and press the ball that is what his system is once you can do that you can play all the prettiest football you like because you wear teams out but you have to one be you have to be extra fit 
Two, you have to have the buy-in from the players in order to do it. And, and three, and probably this is the most important thing, you have to have the right players. Absolutely. To, to, to play it. And unfortunately, you know, Mikel Arteta this season is our third manager. Crazy to think that so, we had we had one manager for, for so long and then we ended up with three in a season. <laughs> And, and you know what, Harry? It, it may it may it may take a, a bit longer because now we've I think we've got the right manager, but now we're going to have to get the right players in because I don't think we've got the right balance of player in our system to play the way Mikel Arteta wants. So there's a there's a lot of to and um, throwing. Who knows what's going to happen with this season? Obviously, we've we made some a very astute signing last year, which we which a lot of people gave the club stick for, Saliba. Saliba's coming in. So at least we, we've, we've got a centre-half. Big, strong, quick centre-half who is going to go straight into that side. He has to. Do we need another one? Yes, we probably do. Will we get one? Who knows? So if we can get Saliba in and, and, and bed him in nicely, then at least that defence look is a, is a lot younger and is a, is a lot stronger. Absolutely. Absolutely, Kevin. Some some great points, some really interesting points. And and like you, I've got quite high hopes for, for Saliba. He seems to be doing pretty well in France at the moment. Um, so fingers crossed he can come in and have a an immediate impact on this team. One of the other topics that is being discussed in the media at the moment uh, quite sort of frequently is Obviously, we know we spoke at the top of the show about the the coronavirus and the impact that that's having, um, the economical impact as well, which of course shouldn't be overlooked. People are calling for for footballers to to come out and now say, well, yeah, we'll take a pay cut, so that um, the clubs can keep on, I guess, their non playing staff without them being at as much risk of losing their jobs. I'm not sure where I stand on this. I've been thinking about it, and I can't really come to a definitive conclusion as to whether I think that is the right thing to do or not. Um, I guess from one point, I think, why should they be asked to cut their wages? There are plenty of other well-paid people in this country. And on the other hand, I think, well, actually, they some of them do earn incredible amounts of money, so would it do them much harm? As an ex-player, I'm sure you've got a little bit more insight into this. If you were in that situation, um, do you think that it's fair for, I guess, the authorities to kind of ask footballers to do this? Because, again, like I said, I'm, I'm not sure. Well, it's, it's amazing. The, the same authorities um, who ask the footballers, um, it, and it's funny, football's, football is a kind of a buzzword when it comes to anything that goes wrong. You know, oh, they earn enough money, but there's a, they're, not the rich, they're not the wealthiest people on the, in the country, footballers. Footballers earn a good money and it's it's for a short period. And I think that the, the, the players will anyway, if there was um, a, taking pay cuts for deferral is one thing. Taking a pay cut is totally different. Agreed. So a deferral, I, I'm all for a deferral because you're contracted and, you know, once we get over this, then obviously everybody goes back to the, the same money and then the club just work it out when they when they pay them the, the excess. That's fair enough. So other members of non-playing members can get, get paid. That's fine. But the, the way everybody zeroes in on footballers every single time to to take pay cuts, to do this, to do that. And what people have to understand as well, Harry, and this is probably the most significant thing, whatever number people come up with in their head that footballers earn, they don't earn that. Yeah, of course, they pay, uh, excuse my language, they pay a shitload of tax, don't they? Right, when I say a shitload of tax, it's the government who take minimum 50%. Crazy. (laughs) Yeah, so... What what the, the numbers that people think? Yeah, he's taking that. Just half it, and then take national insurance off of that as well. So realistically, you're working more for the more than half a year for the for the state. That's right. When you break it down, that's right. And also, not it's not only that as well. If you're earning a certain amount of money each month or each week or however they're paid, 
you you're going to live within your means aren't you like you know if i had a better paid job i'd have a better house i'd have a better car i'd go out more i'd do the things that i want to do to then ask somebody to put a stop to that and and accept the reduction is not as simple as that because you've still got that big mortgage that you've taken on you've still got your finance payments on whatever else it is you're doing so and it's not and so you know easy. something else harry your family would grow <laughs> <laughs> your family would grow. You start earning hundred thousand pounds a week, your family will grow. People will be coming out the woodwork. You know, you can because because you can help people. The onus for you, you're like a bank. So the onus on you is to help people. Now, if you help one, you've got to help the others. Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's absolutely right. These are so, and, and that's why I wanted to ask you this question because you've been a footballer, you know yeah. the other side of it, and I think it's very easy for people, particularly those that aren't really into football, to sit there and go, "Oh, but they earn this much money, and they yeah. should be helping out." Well, there are plenty of other professions where people earn ridiculous amounts of money, well above what they're worth, and so why is it always footballers that we look at? You're absolutely yeah. right. I don't. I don't hear anybody saying about people in the music industry who earn fortunes. You know, why don't they? Why don't they? You know, put some money together. Agreed. But you know, it's because it, it's easy. Footballers are an easy target. And again, I'm not saying that footballers wouldn't do. Uh, I know footballers like to do things anonymous because when they do things anonymous, they have that. They they are helping but they're not getting any eyes on them. Yeah. Whereas now, this thing's coming out and, and, and so, do you know what? Some of these clubs who are, who are actually asking, they're, they're mega wealthy in their own right. They should never be coming to the footballers and say, you know, you need to take a cut. They, they're doing that solely because they could keep, <laughs> they could not sp pay out so much money. Yeah, exactly. When really they could pay the non the non playing staff easily. Yeah, absolutely, and I agree with everything you've said. And I've where I have got some sympathy for the government in this situation is when you're hearing of clubs like Spurs. Um, and I know I imagine that by the time we release this podcast, there will be other clubs that have done the same thing. And Newcastle already did it previously to Spurs, but to hear of I guess what you call Premier League giants doing what Spurs have done. It, it just it drives me absolutely crazy because that is putting more pressure on the government. If that stops, then we don't need to ask anybody to take pay cuts. But clubs and businesses of the size of, of Tottenham Hotspur, for example, they they have just seen an opportunity to cut down their costs and they've jumped right on it. That deserves more criticism to me than a, right. a player not uh, accepting taking a pay cut. I think that is the real issue here. Can I challenge that then, Harry? Go ahead. Okay. How many years has the Premier League been going? 20 odd years. Yep. There's Give been no take, breaks. Yeah. There's been no breaks. All of these, all of these well played, well paid professional footballers, the whole squad, the whole clubs have paid taxes, etc. for 20 odd years. They've made billions, correct? Yep. Right. The one moment something totally out of hand happens it's an act of god or whatever you want to call it F force majeure happens why shouldn't the government give these institutions because that's what they are they're, they're, they're like the football clubs but they're institutions why shouldn't they get a bit of help i think what i would say to that kevin is i think talking in terms of what you're saying i think you're absolutely right they are businesses that pay uh, a lot of tax and they help the economy a great deal and I agree with you entirely there but I think morally uh, they've got a an, and I'm not you know if this went on for nine months a year I would totally understand where they're coming from but do, do you think that Tottenham can't afford to pay their I guess their non-playing staff for three months without it having a huge impact on them as a club they've just built a stadium for god knows how many millions they spend 60 million pounds on one player for example so yeah Harry but the problem the, the issue the issue isn't the issue isn't the players who are are, are are contracted 
It's the people who are not contracted. That's the issue. And when you're dealing with um, employment law and all this kind of thing, these people would lose their jobs. But I, I guess t- taking it from the other point of view, Liverpool, for example, and you could argue that they're in a better financial position than Tottenham, but Liverpool have agreed to pay their casual staff, as they call them, who are not contracted, that only work on match days, uh, mm. for the period that the Premier League has been suspended. Now, I'm not, not it's not because I'm an Arsenal yeah, fan. Everton have, have done it as well. Yeah, Liverpool I, and Everton have done it, yeah. And it's not because I want to just have a go at Tottenham, but it, it just drives me... I guess I find it strange that I didn't expect it from, I guess, what I would call the big six. The big, the, the big yeah, boys. I expected it from maybe Bournemouth. I expected it from some of the clubs in the lower part of the league who financially maybe don't have the power. But I think that there's a bit, there's an obligation and there's a responsibility given the TV money and everything else that they earn for the top, top football clubs in this country to do the thing that's morally right. And as you've said, there are others who have led by example and done the right thing, which makes it even more disappointing for me personally that Spurs have opted to do something different. Well, Harry, this is what I will say. The what's being what's being offered um, by by the government is a, to help people keep their jobs. Now, if it's going to help. If it's going to help people be stay employed, why not? Why not? Why? Who's to say that the clubs the clubs shouldn't be um, blasé about seeking seeking some of the help for the non playing staff? Fair enough. If it was the playing staff, definitely not. Then they, you know, that's their they're contracted to the club, etc. But the non playing staff, who a lot of people think. You know, they, you know, their, their wages aren't, aren't big, but there's many of them, and and at the big clubs, you know, the, the stewards and stuff like that. There's there's thousands because of the the way the clubs have to run their, their, their these departments. There's there's there might only be small, but there's many of them. So I just think the fact of the matter is the government are, are, are put things in place to help. And I think it's up to the club if the club want to help or the club need the help, because a lot maybe some of these departments aren't fully run inside the football club, and I'm sure they've taken legal advice. Yeah, that's 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 a great point. That's the other thing you see. I think they've taken legal advice, and you know how do we actually protect these guys? Well, the best way to protect them is get them on the government scheme. Yeah, it, it so, makes sense, and I'm sure there's more, there's far more ins and outs to this than than I know, and and I I totally accept that. And you just don't like the narrative, do you? You like to think football's all powerful, and it could, it probably could pay for these guys, Harry. You're right on that sense; it probably could pay for them. But you know, if every little helps, yeah, agree. Kind of thing. I, I totally like. I guess. I, where I agree with you is from, a, a, I guess, a business and a financial standpoint, what you're saying makes complete sense. And you, you are right when you say that the clubs have paid an absolute fortune in taxes and, and all sorts. So why shouldn't they be entitled to it like everybody else? I just mm-hmm. think in a time like this, and, and this is just my opinion, it's not the fact and I, I don't you know claim it to be or anything like that. I just think that there is a bit of a moral obligation for some of these clubs and not all of the clubs, but some of them that we know have the financial muscle. We know Mm. have the power to just be a little bit sensible. And for me, I think Daniel Levy has really, really damaged Spurs I guess their image by doing this because the outrage is everywhere. And I think that being one of the, uh, not the first to do it, but the first of, what I would call the super six in the Premier League. I think he's he shot himself in the foot a little bit there. And I think that there will be repercussions of that down the line. But I mean, we could talk about this all day and I'm conscious that I've already taken up more of your time than planned. So I want to say a massive thank you, Kevin. Really, really been a pleasure. Now, hold on, do you want one more? Go on then, one go on then. Go on. One more, what I put, which I play, I actually played in this. I've got to have this. He's got to have one, go I on. <laughs> I've got to have one that I played in. Obviously, I'm lucky enough, won the title at Arsenal, etc. in 91. But making my debut at Highbury, 
and scoring against Nottingham Forest in front of the North Bank, if I died that day, I'd be happy. <laughs> Harry, as a kid, I stood on the North Bank. I've been there multiple times, travelled, you know, travelled, watched the games, etc. But to get on that football pitch as an Arsenal first team player and score the third goal against Nottingham Forest in the in front of the clock end. That that was wow. That was just an amazing moment for for myself for my family. I could and, only imagine uh, and friends. It really was. I can only imagine because when I was a kid, I, I had the pleasure of taking part in a penalty shootout on the Highbury pitch before a game. I think it was against Fulham at uh, this game, yeah. and the, the stadium was empty at this point. Hardly anybody was in there yet, and and I won the shootout. And I literally ran and sprinted off to the corner flag in front of the clock in and did a knee slide um, and celebrated to absolutely no one. And I I still remember that. It's one of my favourite Arsenal memories. So I can only imagine Fantastic. what it feels like for, for someone who played for the first team in yeah. a situation like that. Um, amazing, amazing. Because if you remember rightly, Harry, we were struggling to score a goal uh, before that game. And... Um, I think we end up we end up winning the game three 0 against a good Nottingham Forest side and stuff like that. And they used to sing, you know, you never beat this Walker and all that kind of thing. Do you remember <laughs> they used to sing all that? And um, you know, I, I got to the ball before Des Walker and I put it in the bottom corner. So that was like that was amazing for me. Amazing. Look, just to be involved with the Arsenal first team was amazing. But to to play a part and score goals and and stuff like that for me is like well, this is we've heard it before, mate. It's it's dreams come. It's it's my dream. My dream always has been and always will be, and I fulfilled some of my dreams, which was fantastic. Brilliant stuff, and they're memories that will live with you and your family and your friends forever. And that's the great thing about them. Kevin, thank you so much, my friend. I really, really appreciate it. As you know, I always am massively grateful when you, you come on the show. It means the world to me talking to one of my former heroes. So, so Well, you're still one of my heroes, to be fair. Um, but it's, it's great um, chatting to you. And thank you so much for taking the time out of your busy day. No problem, Harry. Anytime. And I look forward to speaking to you again soon, mate. Definitely, mate. All the best. Cheers. Bye, Harry. Bye, H. My thanks to Kevin Campbell once again and my thanks to all of you guys for tuning in and sticking with us during this difficult period. Don't forget to leave us a review if you're listening on Apple Podcasts or from whatever platform that you are listening. Uh, Leave us your comments. Don't forget to hit the like button if you're watching us on YouTube uh, and spread the word. Um, It is much appreciated. And like I said, at the very top of the show, we'll be continuing uh, to bring you some what we hope is entertaining content uh, over the next few weeks while everything is still up in the air, while things remain uh, uncertain. But most importantly, guys, stay safe and stay home. Till next time. Cheers. (laughs) 